Good afternoon, everybody. So if you look at the agenda, we have three topics remaining today. Uh, query, and then the programming model for IONS, and then operation. And we are going to um, run late today as much as we started late, so that you get your money's worth. So we started at about um, 9.20, so we'll run until about 5.20. Um, and the way we're going to break this out is that uh, instead of doing the query lab in the class, uh, I will do some example queries up here from the laptop. So we won't do that lab as a lab activity. Um, so we can plow through that, and that'll allow us to get through the rest of the day. I want to do it that way because the uh, query lab stuff, I know it's new to some people, but it's fairly old to Datomic, and there's existing training materials and the labs you can go and do on your own, and we're happy to continue to support you in Slack, whereas the stuff that has to do with IONS and deployment models is all fairly new and is of particular interest to people. So that's how we're going to you know, break things out. Uh, but before we do that, any questions about the transactions and sort of modeling time and looking back at the past that we just did in the lab? Yes? Do you mean the timestamp that's actually applied to the transaction? Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting question. How could it possibly matter? Well, I mean, so one of the challenges that you have is that, that this is not a synchronized clocks system. So right, we're not doing LAN port clocks or any kind of clocks here. So this is just what the wall clock said on the machine that applied the transaction. So trying to you know, read too much into the exact time uh, other than the fact that it will ascend, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get you know worried down at the like millisecond level on you know what the transaction timestamp was. Um, you can know that they're going to go forward in order because if you did have a clock anomaly where you like went back in time 30 seconds on your clock for some reason, Datomic would not take transactions for that 30 seconds. It would reject them. So you will see time going forward linearly, but it's not trying to make a strong promise about clock time. Yes. So the question is if transactions in different time zones would overwrite the values. So the the um, Datomic cloud cluster is going to be running in an AWS region. And so all the actual machines that have the ability to write will be operating from within a single time zone. So the fact that input's coming in from different time zones isn't going to matter. Uh, but what does matter is you know, possible conflict. So uh, Datomic is going to try to route all the traffic for one database to a particular machine. Not because it has to, but because of efficiency. But let's say that that machine is in the, in the middle of keeling over. So. Uh, you have got a three machine cluster and uh, the machine that wants to do the transactions for your system is dead. Uh, the other two machines are going to have tried to get that machine to do it. And then they're going to be disappointed to find that it hasn't. And each of them is going to try to do its own transaction, which might have come from different time zones or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. They might have come from the same user. One of those transactions is going to succeed and the other one's going to fail. So in any case, you're going to be guaranteed that we have this consistency, and if we have to make something fail to make that happen, then we're going to make something fail. And that user who failed is going to sniffle for a little bit and then retry whatever they were doing. OK. So let's talk about query. And let's not skip all the way ahead to lab. That seems silly. Let's go back to query model. So there are four things to talk about with Query, two that are basic and two that are advanced. Uh, I'm going to talk about the two that are basic today, and the other ones are in the slide for your reference. So that's data log and pull. So data log is a uh, logic language for databases that was uh, developed at around the same time as the relational algebra that became SQL. And there are some historical reasons why SQL became more popular and Datalog didn't. 
Uh, but they don't have to do with either one of their effectiveness as a language because they are um, roughly equivalent, right? They're built on the same mathematical foundations and data log is similar to the relational model once you add recursion. Uh, if you took prolog in college, uh, data log was designed, you may remember that prolog was really cool until you had to start putting in cuts and starting manipulating prolog to sort of uh, do things to control the order in which things happen to make sure it terminated. Uh, data log des was designed to be guaranteed to terminate. Uh, and the style of data log, which you've already done in some of these examples, is pattern matching. So we're going to do some queries on a data log database. And our database is going to have four datums in it, just to keep things simple. 42, whose email is jdo. 43, whose email is jane. 42, whose orders is 107. And 42, whose orders is also 141. So that's our entire database for the purpose of this conversation. Now, when you want to make a query against a database, you create a piece of data called a data pattern. And the data pattern both constrains results and binds variables. It's always in the same order, entity, attribute, value, entity, attribute, value. That's always the order. And if the thing in the pattern is a constant, then that's constraining the result. All the things that are going to come back from this query had to have email in this position. Don't have email in this position, you're out. All the things that begin with a question mark are variables. So these are things that are going to be populated as a result of evaluating this clause. So if we go back and look at our database, our database has in it two things whose attribute is email. The first two rows match this. Do you agree? Stay with me. Late in the afternoon. They, they are, they are matching. So customer is going to be bound to 42 and 43. Email is going to be bound to JDO and Jane. Having said that, you could have constants anywhere. So now we're going to bind more constants up front. So entities 42, attributes email, we're only looking for a particular value. That data pattern is only going to match one row, and it only has one variable in it, so it's going to set email to the set that includes jdo at example.com. Variables can appear anywhere. So this is a query about the attributes 42 has. Not its val their values, but just what attributes. What properties do you have? Another thing that this is demonstrating is that anytime you leave stuff off the end, that means you didn't care. So it always starts entity attribute value. This is saying we don't care about the values, we just want to know the attributes. So when you evaluate this data pattern against this database with four at uh, attributes or four datums in it, you're going to get back three rows, but when you actually populate the attribute variable, how many values are going to be in there? Trick question. It's not three, it's two. Why? This is set-based, right? Orders is the same as orders. So this is going to match orders once. This says, tell me everything about 42. Right? We say, entity 42, boy, we really love you. We want to know everything about you. Tell me your attributes and your values. So now we're going to get back three tuples. Email J Doe, orders 107, orders 141. The fact that orders is a collision is now disambiguated by the fact that we're also getting back values. So this is going to bind three tuples. Email J Doe, orders 107, orders 141. These data patterns are plugged into a where clause. And then you specify which variables to return in a find clause. Why would you not return all the variables? Why do you need a find clause in these languages? You could just say we want to, we're going to return all the variables. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. One, at least so far, everything is order-based. So if we were returning all the variables, you'd have to know what order they came back in. But we could solve that pretty easily. We could return them as a map so we knew their names. But the, the situation really is there are times where you don't care, right? That there are internal variables that you joined through to get some piece of information, but you're not interested in those variables in your return. So you don't always want variables in the return, so we're going to specify which ones you get. Anytime you have the same variable appearing in more than one clause, then both of these clauses must, must match for that variable, which means this is a join. So let's imagine that we had a database where 100 customers had email, but only 20 of them had placed orders. This first clause would say, find everybody who has an email. At that point, we'd have 100 customers bound. And then the second clause would say, 
But hey, wait a minute, let's limit that to only the people who have orders, at which point we would have only 20 bound. So each clause is going to further limit the result, joining as necessary. If you're used to uh, relational databases, JDBC, things like that, then you're used to being able to do what are parameterized queries, right? You're not going to have all these values hard-coded in the query. That's accomplished in Datomic with an in clause. The in clause says these things are going to be bound on input. So I want to bind the database on input, and I want to bind email on input. So now I'm going to pass that in as an argument. So this looks like database is the input parameter. It's the first argument after the query, and then it's used uh, in the where clause. Email is the second argument, and then it's used, well, in this case, actually, one, two, three. We should ignore this one. <laughs> you can't do this one in Datomic Cloud. Oh, no, I take that back. You can, if they're the same database. If DB and other DB actually are the same database, you can still do it. So you could do it. Scratch all that. Let's come back here. Database, database, DB, all match. If we continued on with this query, um, email and jdoexample.com match. So this allows you to specify some bindings that have to be true before you even start evaluating the query clauses. With me so far? This is getting really hairy, and we're joining more than one database. When you join more than one database, you have to put the database prefix in every where clause. You'll have noticed that in all the queries you did so far, you never put that dollar sign database prefix, that kind of thing, in your where clause. All right. Predicates. So once a variable is bound, you can further constrain it with a predicate. These things will be evaluated. Notice that this doesn't have data in it. This doesn't have... Um, attributes to match. It has the parentheses. That says, we're going to evaluate a functional predicate. This means that price already has to be bound. Right? We can't compare it to something until it's bound. So this query says, the first line says, bind me item and prices. And the second one says, bind me all the prices that are less than 50. Or I'm sorry, all the prices that, are, that 50 is less than. There is a lot more to query. There are Disjoint clauses, you can do or. Uh, there are rules, uh, which are like materialized views uh, in SQL. So there's a ton more here, um, but this is all I'm going to say about it uh, for today. Uh, there's in-depth query tutorials that use the Music Brains data set. So if you want to, um, there's a link in the slides to how to download the Music Brains data set and install it in your own Datomic node and then query against it, and you can see uh, several more advanced usages of query. But I want to turn our attention to pull. So what pull does, and this is a division um, that we in, that's very powerful now and will become more powerful in the future. There's the phase of a query where you're finding the entities in the world that the facts are about, right? The joining and finding the related, relevant things. And then there's the phase of the query where you're pulling out the specific details. Um, you could pull out all the details with a logic language, right? Everything I'm about to show you could just be done with logic. But it's often more convenient to say, you know what, once I have the entities in hand that I want to think about, I want to declare structurally, navigate from these to their attributes and pull out the attributes that way. So we're going to look at that. So this is um, a pull pattern. This says find the entity ID whose name is Jane. And that name Jane is what's called a lookup ref. So when you see a tuple like that with two pieces, that's saying, I don't want to talk about entity IDs because I don't like remember, remembering numbers like 1001. I want to talk about things by their unique identifier. So this presumes that name is a unique attribute in our system. And so any place that you would use an entity ID, you can instead drop in a tuple attribute value and say, go find me the one thing in the system that has this attribute and value and use that entity ID. This is a really nice little bit of uh, syntactic sugar. It's really more than syntactic sugar, but it, but it functions that way from the user's perspective. Um, so that's going to find that entity ID. And then the selector says, which piece are we going to pull out? So the first piece of the selector in the map here, likes, drills in through likes. And the second piece of the selector drills into name under likes, and then that's going to return broccoli. Similarly, um, here we're going to say, we're going to find the thing that is named pizza. 
and we just switched to broccoli. We changed our mind. Whatever. Uh, we're going to find the thing that's named broccoli. That's better since that's what's in the database. And then here's the tricky part, that little underscore. In Datomic Query and in Datomic Pull, you can navigate attributes backwards by putting an underscore in front of them. This has a couple of implications. The first one is that when you're modeling, you never have to set up relationships in two directions. Right? Either orders have line items or line items have orders. In that case, it's pretty obvious that orders have line items. Um, either song, uh, uh, um, artists have songs or songs have artists, but you don't have to model it in both directions. Once you've modeled it in one direction, if you ever need to go the other direction, you just put the underscore in, and that navigates the relationship in the opposite direction. So this is saying, finding the thing that likes broccoli. So broccoli is entity 1002. We're now working backwards through likes to find entity 1001. And then we are drilling forward again to find the name. So the syntax for pull allows you to say, drill into these attributes, and it allows you to say, drill backwards through these attributes. And you can do that with arbitrary nesting. So if you have a deeply connected database, dare I say a graph, uh, then you could pull back a huge amount of stuff just with a pull without having to do any logic-based query. You could just say, I'm going to find this entity, which is the linchpin of the system, and say, give me all the facts and all the facts of the facts and all the facts of the facts about that entity uh, and pull them back. And this is extremely valuable uh, when building applications because it allows you to say, I'm going to take control of the logic that gets performed. I'm not going to let users submit arbitrary queries through the web interface. But I might be willing to let users submit arbitrary pull expressions and describe exactly what they need to bring back. And people are using this to great effect uh, building ClojureScript and React apps where they're pulling back exactly the data that they need to populate an interface without having to change the server. I don't know in advance which data I want to show in the interface, um, but when I do know, I can send the pull expression uh, over to the server and then use that to populate. Question? Yeah. Um, what are the performance implications of using the entity ID and the reverse navigation? The entity ID, so what are the performance of using the entity ID and the reverse navigation? Reverse navigation is exactly as performant as forward navigation because they're both always governed by an index. So there's no performance concern about that really at all. Yes? So the question is, you know, wow, lookup refs seem pretty nice and they get me out of the business of talking about famous large numbers. So wouldn't I want to do that wherever I could? Generally, yes. Right? There's, you know, there's not a compelling reason most of the time to say, I want to go think about numbers. Now, that being said, if you have the numbers in hand, um, you know, one thing you might be doing uh, is a batch process that builds up a bunch of data offline. Um, you're already going to the database to get information to build up the batch. You could build up that batch with numbers instead of with lookups because if you do build it with lookups, you're forcing the database to do the lookup twice. But I don't think it's a huge deal. Right? But if you're writing a program, one of the things is this is a very programmable system. right? The transactions are data. The pull expressions are, are data. The queries are data. So a lot of times you're writing programs that make data that you're never going to see. When you're writing a program that makes data that you're not looking at as a human user, then you don't really care about the difference between a lookup ref and an opaque ID. So at that point, you know, uh, <laughs> use whichever one you have in hand, right? I wouldn't go to a lot of trouble one way or the other. Yes? Can an attribute's local name begin with an underscore? Can an attribute's local name uh, begin with an underscore? No. But as with many things in Datomic, don't count on that to be enforced with an exception. Just don't do it. Other questions? All right. Uh, we are not going to talk about raw index access and filters today, but we're going to do instead. Yes. So 
Uh, a lot of these slides were written to be really basic and not re require as much like thinking to process. So a lot of the names are not namespaced, but in general, I would use namespace names everywhere. So, so this is sort of like explaining the ideas, but I would use namespace. The namespace component comes before the slash and the name, and I would expect to be using namespace names everywhere in an actual system. Yes? So we had, the question was, if I have two or three different entities in my head, all of which have email addresses, I would still pick a namespace prefix for them. And we saw that, if you go back and look at the data modeling example we did earlier, we had stories, comments, and users in that system. The thing that could be used by more than one entity was the comment reference, and that still was prefixed, and it was prefixed with the name of the entire domain, which was news. So I picked a prefix that, that was sort of an aggregating prefix for the whole domain. But I would stick with uh, prefix names, right? Just like you don't use the default package in your Java programs. Right? Don't use unqualified names when you're making schema. So, so let's back up a little bit. There's no, the names are meaningless to Datomic, right? They get translated into numbers. So the fact that it had a namespace or not when you made it has no meaning to Datomic whatsoever. It cannot possibly be interpreted differently one, one way or the other. So, so there's no way that that can matter. And there's no special logic that's like find me all the things that have the same namespace or find me all the things that have the same unqualified local name. You can write things like that with predicates. So one thing you might do if you were having a meta, some sort of meta schema analysis, you could say, I'm going to go query my schema, and then I'm going to use a functional transformation inside of query to say, pull off the namespace. And now I can look at the raw name and find all the ones that match. So you could do that, but Datomic's not going to do that for you. All right, this is Jarrett Binford's moment to shine. Jarrett is the support lead for Datomic, and some of you have been interacting with him over the course of the day uh, in the room. And he's been dying for this moment when he had the ability to put stuff on the screen that you would see. So here we go. Let's see. Wow, that's large. So I'm going to show you a real-world application query. So this example uh, is available on GitHub. It's called the Ion Event example. I guess that's a little bit too small. Can you read that? Medium OK? All right. So the thing I want to call your attention to here is, if I can find it, is this query. So let me tell you what the data model here is. The data model is I'm tracking deployments into AWS. And so uh, if you look at the query, I have e deploy time time. So that is what time the deployment happened. And then I have uh, less than or equal since time. So this is a query where you specify, I want to find all the deploys since some moment in time that were recorded in this database. Then, notice that inside of the find, I have a pull expression, which is hard to see when it's green, so let me move away from it. So right above the green line, the find says, don't give me back the entity ID. Instead, pull out from the entity some specific information about the entity. The first thing I'm pulling out is star. That means everything at one level of nesting. So that'll get all the immediate facts about the entity. But I also want to know the application name the deploy application is an entity. I want to drill one level deeper and get the name. Likewise, the deployment group is one level deeper. I want to get the name. So those additional map expressions are saying, drill into the application, pull out the application name, drill into the group, pull out the application name. So when we run this query, so I'll find all the deployments in the last six hours.
you can see that we're getting back maps that are flat at the top, but then under application and group, they have nested submaps because I asked for, get me everything from the top, but get me these additional pieces of information at those levels. So these are the deployments that somebody made to something <laughs> over the last six hours. And, well, let's go ahead and do it. So I tell you what, I'm going to show you how this data got into the system. So in, in AWS, you can, boy, that's big. Why did that get so big? If I, there we go. In AWS, you can make what's called a rule. And a rule is you go into your CloudWatch uh, dashboard, so that's over on the left where you pick rules. You say, give me a list of possible events that are associated with an AWS service. So I went to AWS Code Deploy and said, I want to make a rule that whenever a Code Deploy event happens, I'm going to call a Lambda whose name is Stu8 Code Deploy. I did not write this Lambda. I then created a function called datomic, uh, I hate the green line, it's killing me. The green line's right below what I'm pointing at. I created a function called datomic ion event example event handler and I told Datomic to make a Lambda for me. So I wrote a pure fo closure function that I developed at the REPL, and then I told Closure to make a Lambda for me, or I told um, Ions to make a Lambda for me. So if we look at that function that I wrote, it looks like... It's event handler function. So this event handler is called um, with some input. We um, create an event in the CloudWatch logs saying that we're doing this. The, we then grab a connection to the database, get con. We then take the input, which is some JSON data that came from Amazon, right? They're in charge of the format. And then we call two functional transformations to convert that into data log or convert that into transaction data that we can put into Datomic. So that's that event to TX and add refs. And then we transact the data into the database. The thing that's nice about this function is what do I need to have running to test this function? Right? I don't need to actually wire this up. This is a function that if I have a database around, I can just test it locally. So I can say, let's keep a copy. Let's see. So here's an example payload. And one of the things that AWS does that's really cool is when you go through that UI to say, I want to respond to an event, it will give you sample payloads for all the, the different events. So I actually copied this payload out of AWS, and then I developed this function entirely interactively at the REPL. So I sat at the REPL, and I wrote the function, and I tried it, and I can run it here. Let's see. So I'll grab failure. So that blob of JSON represents a code deployment failure. I can then call the event handler here. Sorry about that. Go away. There we go. I can then call that event here. I'll get a message that tells me it's been posted to Slack. And then we can go and look in the Slack channel. And we can see that that deployment happened. So I've broken this problem into parts such that I can develop and test all the functions at the REPL, right? One part is I have to transform a JSON payload that comes from Amazon into some transaction data. Another part is I have to call Datomic and transact that data in. Um, and now I can check recent deploys and I'll get um, a different deploy. Now, 
I also want to be able to interact with Slack. So in the course of doing this, uh, I wrote an API for talking to Slack. Um, this is a great example of data-oriented programming. There are, in fact, closure APIs for talking to Slack. But you don't need them, right? What does talking to Slack consist of? Right? It consists of sending data over HTTP or HTTPS to Slack, so to some endpoint. So if you look at the actual implementation of that, There's actually nothing to do, right? The whole, the whole job is actually making a piece of data, right? In order to take, talk to Slack, I have to know the server name, the server port, the headers, the URI, the body, the request method, and the scheme. So there's a piece of data that describes that Slack post. And then with that in place, I can post a message to Slack. Again, I developed and tested this function entirely at the REPL, interacting with the system. And how did I know when it was working? I did not do TDD, I'll give you a hint. Right, how did I know when it was working? I went and looked in Slack and saw a message appear. So we can do that. We'll start talking to Jarrett and see if he answers us. So I'll post a message to Slack. Now, of course, this will be the moment where, nope, there we go. So we got back an OK true. And now if we go and look in Slack, we'll see that we said, hi, Jarrett. And in a minute, look, Jarrett's answering us. He doesn't know he's actually talking to a program. I also want Slack to be able to talk to me. Now, the integration that we saw so far was based on internal AWS stuff. So an AWS event happens, and then we call me through a Lambda, which is another AWS thing. But Slack is not an AWS thing. So what do you suppose Slack's integration is going to look like? It looks like you have to register a web endpoint. So now I need to put a web API endpoint on the internet. OK. I'm not afraid. OK, maybe a little bit afraid. So now we have. A web service. What does a web service look like in the land of datomic ions? A web service looks like a function that takes a web request and makes a web response. What else could a web service look like? I would be really embarrassed if I had to make call factory methods or have scaffolding classes or some kind of giant monstrosity to do this. It would be really awkward. So it's a function. It takes headers and body. We know the body is going to be JSON because that's what Slack speaks. So that line is reading some JSON. Then we grab the database out of the connection. Then we find out what channel we're supposed to talk to from a configuration parameter. We'll talk about that more later. Then we check to see if we're verified, because Slack has a lightweight security mechanism where you can check a verification token. If we're um, in the middle of a, if we're not verified, we return a 503. If we are verified, then we have to look and see if we're in a challenge. When you're in a challenge, that's a back and forth with Slack, then you just have to return the body. Otherwise, we're going to post a Slack message, which is a table of recent deploys. So the way this works is I have wired up this web service, which is this is pretty much the whole implementation of it. Like, there's a little helper function. Well, let's get an all-in count. Right? This entire application is 262 lines. It consists of the API for talking to Slack and the data transformation to put data in the database, the query to get data out of the database, the callback to handle getting things from Lambda, and a web service to handle getting things back from Slack. And I can go and, well, first let's try it from in here. I can say, actually, let's not try it from in here. Let's go try it from the, I have it wired up to this bot that's called deploy status. So if you speak to the deploy status bot, uh, bot, it will bark back at you with a table, hopefully. Come on, deploy status bot. Hello, deploy status bot. Where are you? 
There we go. So the table is an ASCII table, so it doesn't look very good at this size. We'd have to shrink it up a bunch. I can't shrink it enough. So this is why I'm not in charge of the UI. I made an ASCII art table on a web page. It's the best I could come up with. But the important point about this to me, uh, I guess there's two points. One, I was able to break this problem up into really small bite-sized pieces, each of which could be done with a function. And two, I was able to do all of my development and testing at the REPL. Right? I could say, I want to build this interactively from my laptop, and then when I'm done, when I'm ready to ship this, that looks like this. So this is, this is taking my current project and saying, I want to push a release named Stu. In the land of Datomic Ions and in the land of AWS Code Deploy, which is where we get the language from, push means, it really means, well, in Maven land, it would mean in Maven install, right? This means create a package and install that package somewhere. So when I do this, that's going to take my application and bundle it up and install it in S3. <coughs> then, having done that, I can deploy. So normally these steps might be far apart in time, right? I might push the application and decide to deploy it tomorrow or deploy it to staging first, but I'll just go straight on to it. When I deploy the application, Amazon is going to install the code for my application on every box in my group, on every virtual box in my group that I've deployed to. It's going to do that in a rolling fashion, so there's no downtime. Now, in my case, I'm running a solo system, as you are in the class today, so rolling isn't going to help very much because there's only one. So there actually will be downtime. There's like 30 seconds of downtime. You know, while that box, it doesn't relaunch the box, it just kills the Java process and restarts it with my application. So my application is going to be up on that box uh, in about 30 seconds. It should be done now. Um, in addition, it's going to uh, make all the lambdas, all the connective tissue that I requested in my configuration file. And because I've already deployed it once, it's smart and won't do that again. So it will see all those lambdas already exist and their configuration is unchanged. So none of that stuff will have to happen again. And you can see all that happening, or you could if I can't get Chrome to go any smaller. Where do we want to go to see it? Right, you can see the deployments happening in what's called AWS Code Deploy. So these revisions represent different revisions of the application that I've deployed in the past. And then I can go to a particular group and see what application is deployed there. So once it's up in Amazon, this aspect of it is entirely generic, like someone who knew how to admin Amazon Web Services could look at this and go, oh, I understand what's going on here, right? We just de deployed a code deploy application. So that's where we're headed, this programming model where you can serve your entire application from Datomic Cloud. You develop your functions dynamically at the REPL. So I didn't show you that part. I showed you the result of that part. All right, I showed you my code that I had worked on at the REPL. You push artifact revisions. You deploy those revisions, and then you configure, uh, and I saw the, showed you the configuration file, that's the ion config Eden, and then you bond. The bond part I didn't show you, that's outside the scope of what we do with ions, that's where you connect it to other things in AWS. So that's where you go in CloudWatch and say, on this event, call this Lambda. Or you go in Amazon API Gateway and say, when this web request comes in, call this Lambda. So the idea behind this is, that having developed Datomic Cloud, we solved all these problems about interacting with AWS, and people who wanted to write applications were standing on the outside feeling sad because they have all the same problems, right? Their program needs to run on AWS as well. They want auto-scaling. They want EC2. They want DynamoDB. They want load balancing and so forth. And so what we want to do is provide a solution that lets them do that, that covers these issues. Uh, one problem that we wanted to cover is we don't want to wait for data. 
right? Datomic is a peer-oriented uh, system where your database is in memory with you. And if you have to go in via a client to get it, that's no longer true. So that's an argument for let's put the code on a machine that has in-memory access to the data. Uh, we want people to be able to deliver complete systems that have multiple applications uh, from one centralized point of control. One thing that's sort of challenging about building things out of lambdas is where's your higher no order notion of what you've made, right? I have a system that consists of these 74 lambdas, right? But where's the abstraction that governs those? So ions provide that higher level abstraction. Uh, also, uh, we find that the whole story about um, deploying uh, serverless funds or deploying artifacts to be uh, fraught, let's say. There are a lot of things about it that are not as easy uh, as they could be, and we really want to stay focused on the application domain. So when you go back to this picture, which one of these things do we really care about? We really care about dev, right? We have to do all these other things. We have to get the system out there, but we really care about, we're trying to build a system, and to the extent that we're doing these other things and that they're getting in our way, it's a distraction. So here's the workflow. You start a project on your machine with a bunch of local dependencies, and you're using Git. So there's a, it's a given here that you're going to be using Git. And uh, you write some functions, and you write a configuration file. The functions are ordinary closure functions, and the configuration file says which ones are callable and which ones become lambdas. And that's pretty much it, what's callable and what's lambdas. Then you execute a push. When you push... Uh, the ION infrastructure will bundle up all your stuff and copy it to S3. So here's another thing that we hate, Uber jars. Right? Uber jars are yucky because you make a tiny change to your program and what do you deploy? A huge thing, right? Don't want to do that. So the deployment that IONs do is totally granular. It still remembers all your raw dependencies as raw dependencies. So it deploys all the individual small jars and if you change your application, the 30 jars your application uses didn't change. Those don't have to be copied up again or kept track of again. So there's a granular notion of deployment. Because we're using depths.eden uh, and closures tools.depths, our notion of dependencies is both Maven and Git. So this is really an important point, right? Closure has for a long time lived with Maven because it's what's out there. And even if you're not using Maven per se, if you're using Liningen or Boot or Gradle, any of the other tools, you are still in a certain fundamental sense using Maven because it's the underlying file formats that Maven uses to say what stuff is that those other things are speaking to. You can do that, so you can declare your dependencies with Maven, but you can also de declare your dependencies with Git. So you can say, my application depends on this other Git repo at this SHA. And you can mix and match those things. So if you're like me, you live with one foot in the old world and one foot in the new. All my Java libraries, ugh, I have to depend on with Maven, but all the new stuff I'm writing with Clojure, ah, I get to depend on with Git, and I can mix and match those. What's that? So the question is, except in the case of private Maven repos, well, what would be a problem about a private Maven repo? So, uh, so the question is, what is depths.eden able to support? Uh, depths.eden now does support private Maven repos. It may not support all scenarios. Um, but from the point of view of this architecture, there's nothing about repos being private that matters. So if there's something about that that's not working, then when it is working, uh, that, because all the stuff is not in the private Maven repo by the time you're done. Everything is in the code bucket on S3. So when you create a Datomic Cloud, system, it makes a bucket that's system-wide called your code bucket. And so that bucket is where all of your uh, uh, Maven dependencies and Git dependencies and what have you go. It also creates a code deploy application. So Datomic makes a code deploy application for you automatically. So you already have one on your system because you installed Datomic Cloud on your cloud system, not on your laptop. Uh, and in addition to making all this stuff in S3, it makes a rev, which is a strong name, pointing to that. So you have a strongly named thing that points to an immutable rev. And I should just say, 
You can cheat on the strong naming and immutability. There's kind of like a dev mode where you can use weak names. So that's, you know, because sometimes you don't care. That's fine. If you're deving, you may want to be a little bit lighter weight than that. But for production, you want strong names and immutable uh, revisions. Um, and those two things are in different namespaces, right? So the, re the immutable revisions are named by uh, SHAs. And so you're not going to be able to accidentally, like, overwrite one of those. Your, your names will be, like, Stu's harebrained exper experiment or whatever. So at this point, you developed an application. You saw it work locally, hopefully. You ran your automated tests or whatever, and there's no code running anywhere. You just have an immutable package in your AWS account that you can use. Then you deploy. When you deploy, you pick a particular revision and say, I want to run this revision of code on my Datomic nodes. All of your Datomic nodes are running AWS code deploys daemon, which is sitting there saying, you know what? I'm ready to stop the process that's running on this box, pull down new code, start a new process. Uh, code deploy reaches out to the box and says, and let's say there are three. It reaches out to the first box and says, boom, you're dead. Here's code. The box grabs the code, wakes back up, starts running the code. And then the uh, health check through the auto scaling group, load balancer, the health check says, I'm going to ping this with the health check until I'm good. If that's not good, the deployment's over. Right? If we don't get to the, a good health check within a minute or 30 seconds or whatever the timeout is set to, then we're done. We failed to deploy. The deploy gets rolled back. If we are good, we're now running the new code on one box and the old code on the other two boxes, and we proceed forward through the other boxes until we have everybody uh, on the new code. In addition, the deployment step in IONS looks at your configuration file and says, do you need lambdas? Have you said in your configuration file, I want to expose some of my functions through Lambda? And let's say you have three functions that you want to expose through Lambda. One of them is your web service, and two of them are event handlers for AWS events. Then it will look at your Lambda configuration and see if you already have those Lambdas. Maybe you've been running the system for a while. If so, you're done. If not, it will automatically provision those Lambdas. So after deployment, you have your running code, running on a bunch of nodes, and Lambdas that you can use to get to them. Then you configure how do you want things to get to those lambdas. For your AWS services, you go into CloudWatch to the rules section and you say, when somebody puts a file in this bucket in S3, generate a JSON payload and call this lambda, which is then handled by your closure function. If you want to expose a web service, then you set up an API gateway and you say inside the API gateway, I want this API gateway to call a lambda. And so if we go back to, it's a little bit hard to see. So I'm inside the Amazon API Gateway page, and I have set up a API Gateway that responds to any verb. And the important detail about it, if I can get back to the important detail about it, is that the method request is handled by a lambda. So this is not part of Datomic Cloud. This is part of me futz futzing around with AWS. I went in and set up API Gateway and said, API Gateway, when you get a request from the web, turn around and call this Lambda. And the Lambda that I turn around and call is Stu8 Compute Slack Event Handler. So Datomic Cloud will take the name of your system or the name of your group, in which in my case is Stu8 Compute, and then the name of your closure function which in my case is Slack Event Handler, and paste them together and make a Lambda of that name. So I now have a Lambda of that name, and here I've wired it into API Gateway. Now at this point, as a person who does not want to worry about the web, I'm done. Right? I call in experts on you know, preventing den a distributed denial of service attacks and say, here, you have credentials to configure my API Gateway to make it do all the things about being a doorway to the internet, because I'm not an expert on that. Right, so you know, somebody else can worry about that separation of concerns. That's a beautiful thing. So this is what the configuration looks like. As I said, there are really two things you have to say in your configuration. What functions can be called and which ones of those functions can be exposed from Lambda. The other reasons that you might want to call a function without exposing it from a Lambda, you might want to call it inside of a query. So I showed you before that you could call a really boring predicate inside your query, less than. 
but you can actually call arbitrary functions that you wrote inside query. Because remember, your code is running on the same box where the query is. Likewise, you can call your programs inside of transactions. So transaction functions or query functions might show up in the allow clause of this file. They're not exposed through Lambda, but they are things you want to be able to call. And this prevents you from sort of running haywire and accidentally calling the wrong thing or not, you know, you don't want to just call arbitrary functions. Then consumers come in here three ways. The first thing is Lambda has an API. So as soon as you've put stuff in Lambda, you now have a new way to get in and let other programs interact with you. They can use the Lambda API, and you can do security configuration not on Datomic, but on just that Lambda. Right? You can go to that Lambda and say, my three trusted friends have permission via IAM to call that Lambda. They don't even have to know you wrote it in Clojure. This is sort of the point of distributed systems, right? You shouldn't have to know what's on the other side. Right? Here, the thing that's on the other side from the user's perspective is a Lambda in any case. And then Amazon services will generate events and then people coming in from the web will come in through API Gateway. So, this is the scary picture. This is all the things together in one picture. But you don't have to be scared because you live only on the left-hand side of this picture. Right? The line where push and deploy of, everything on the left side you do, everything on the right side Datomic Cloud does for you. So you start, you dev at your own local box, you write code, you test it locally. You use the Datomic Sox proxy to get access to a database when you need to actually use the database for your testing. When you're happy, you push. The push puts your code up in S3 and creates a revision and code deploy. When you want to install that somewhere, you call deploy. That creates a deployment and runs that deployment against your nodes, waiting for them to health check, standing up your code, and it ensures that your lambdas exist. It uses your configuration to uh, specify which lambdas are going to be exposed. You then configure or bond your services and the API gateway as you see fit to provide entry points to your application and then go to town. This can have a very low total cost of operating in AWS. There's a lot of factors that combine here to help you do that, right? So how many servers do you need now? I mean, what we're finding is a lot of people are just running one. Right, if you're running a departmental app that can take a 30 second outage, then just run a solo system and go to town. And then you can scale up massively from there when you need to. Okay, let's take a 20 minute break and then we'll come back and resume and talk about uh, operating Datomic in the cloud. So I'll see you in 20 minutes.